Uh, I am thrilled to be able to welcome you to our annual gathering, which is not exactly the one we had intended a year ago, uh, but caused by a global crisis that we've been working to understand and prevent for almost two decades. Last year, when we assembled our friends and supporters in person at Gustavino's, honoring Linda Obst for her television series, The Hot Stone, Peter said, Peter Desek, our president said, we are standing between you and the next pandemic. Well, guess what, here we are, not what we expected. We are gratified that while we've not been able to gather in person, we do have a very large audience tonight, really over 350 of you registered, and there are many more who are joining. And what we will be exploring are the fundamental questions. Where do outbreaks come from? How might we change our behaviors to prevent them? And once there's a spillover, how can we identify it and stop it close to its source? When we were developing this year's theme, not knowing what was coming, we were thinking about alliances, those incredible partners that we have all around the world who extend our global reach and with whom we're working side by side in bat caves, uh, testing local animals, educating local communities on safe practices that could save their lives and isolating outbreaks at their source. And while they are on the front lines in their own countries during the current lockdown, our scientists have been of counsel to them and to organizations all over the world, as well as to their governments uh, to mitigate the impact of the current crisis. We're deeply grateful also for the sponsors that so generously supported tonight's event. We wanna thank you, especially wanna thank Bayer for its generous support of the evening. Bayer has a saying, science for a better life. We couldn't agree more. It's exactly what we believe at EcoHealth Alliance. Our science aims to identify threats to our safety in the form of new and emerging diseases and use science to stop them. We wanna thank all of you many of whom gave us contributions when you registered, that was unexpected. And many of you are vigorously bidding in our wonderful auction. We have a lot of experiences. We decided to limit it to that this year. Uh, and I think that any of you who are lucky enough to win will be so excited to go to the French Laundry or take a tour of Christie's or go to a, on a walk with Kevin Oliveau to see the bats on Central Park. It will be all the sweeter because we've been locked up for so long. So now I'd like to turn the program over to Peter Dasik, our president, um, who's one of the leading voices himself, bringing science and reason to every conversation he's a part of. We're really proud of Peter and our other scientists, several of whom you'll meet tonight, because of the incredible work they've done up to now and continue to do during this lockdown. We look all look forward to a day when we might achieve our purpose of preventing the next pandemic with support of so many of you who now recognize that this isn't any longer a far-fetched possibility. It's not just a plane ride, but inevitable in a world where the health of all living things is a matter of life and death to us humans as well. Peter? Over to you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you, everybody, for showing up tonight. It's a real joy to see you all. You know, we're a very collegial group. Um, I, I love our benefits when we get together, have a glass of wine, and talk about the work we do, and see your support and shake hands. Obviously, we're not doing that tonight. Um, you know, EcoHealth Alliance's mission is to prevent pandemics, is to understand the science behind them, to find out why they emerge, the drivers of pandemics, which turn out to be the same drivers that cause huge loss of species around the world, deforestation, the wildlife trade. These are the issues that seem to be involved in the emergence of this pandemic, COVID-19. And that really strengthens our resolve to deal with emerging threats like these pandemics. So tonight we're going to talk about our vision. We're in the pandemic era. Our vision is to get out of the pandemic era we see a world without pandemics. We see a world where, where our balance with nature is restored, where our footprint is reduced and where we have a, a healthier planet and a healthier us and healthier wildlife. We're gonna talk about that vision. You're gonna meet the scientists who are on the ground making that vision a reality. And I hope you're gonna join us, not just join us tonight, but join us for the rest of this journey as we come out of this pandemic and move forwards. 
<clears throat> so let's just talk a little bit about this pandemic, COVID-19. Where did it come from? Why did it spread so rapidly? Why are we in such a, um, a terrible position right now, this darkest hour of, of this pandemic? You know, COVID-19, like most other pandemics, seems to have a wildlife origin. It seems to be a virus caused by a virus that um, originated probably in bats, probably in Southwest China or countries adjacent, that seems to be um, emerged through the wildlife trade to some extent and through encroachment into wildlife habitat. It spread extremely quickly. We all thought that it would be able to be controlled, but it got, it got out, it got out too quickly for that control. And this is what viruses do. They spread, they, uh, they adapt, they use our networks and our communication and our social contact to spread. And of course, to defeat that, we're now in the situation where we have to lock down and really change our behavior for the, for the time being. And I think right now, even though we're in our darkest hour, um, we can start to think about what it's gonna be like to come out of this pandemic. There are some really promising uh, developments. Just yesterday, we heard about the new drug Remdesivir, which seems to be a breakthrough, which may actually be able to cure people who are in the critical throes of this disease. That drug Remdesivir was developed based on some of the science that we've done around the world and in China in particular, um, looking for bat origin coronaviruses. It's a great joy to be a little part of that drug success. That's what we need, the good news we need, but it's still a long journey. So how are we going to change when we come out of this pandemic? Well, one thing we need to look at really seriously is why we're still living with this unprecedented wildlife trade. So we've turned to one of our longtime friends and colleagues and allies, Dr. John Paul Rodriguez, who is now head of the Species Survival Commission of the IUCN, the, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. John Paul. As Peter mentioned in the introduction, I chair the UCN Species Survival Commission, known as SSC. This is a network of over 9,500 experts in 170 countries, a very rich source of knowledge and information. Our work ranges from assessing the status of plants, fungi, and animals for the UCN Register of Threatened Species, to conservation planning, to catalyzing conservation action. All of what we do is evidence-based. So the science informs decision-making and public policy. Now, over the years, we have carried out a series of synthetic studies that we call situation analysis. They aim to compile all the scientific evidence underlying a particular species conservation issue and inform the variety of policy interventions available to policymakers. A typical situation analysis takes one to two years to complete at a cost of a few hundred thousand dollars. Now, COVID-19 has presented us with a major challenge, both in terms of urgency and impact. As you're aware, the virus originated from wildlife. And though the path of infection is not certain, the media and many scientists have made a link between the virus and wildlife trade. Some non-governmental organizations have called for a total ban of wildlife consumption and trade, while others, such as the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, recommend a more cautious approach that protects communities that rely on wildlife for their livelihood. So the stage is set for SSC to come in and mobilize its network to provide the evidence base for nations to decide how to move forward once the pandemic peaks. Optimistically, in two or three months, we will have reached such a stage, the peak of the pandemic. So SSC's situation analysis on the link between wildlife trade and the transfer of pathogens to humans needs to be completed in such a time frame. We have reached out to Professor Richard Koch to lead the study. He co-chairs the SSC Wildlife Health Specialist Group jointly with Billy Koresh, you may have heard of him, as well as of Catherine Machalava, who worked with both of them. But instead of the two years and hundreds of thousands of dollars the typically situation analysis it costs, we're planning to do it in three months and at a tenth of the cost. We want to be ready 
with a detailed and authoritative document before the United Nations General Assembly Summit on Biodiversity meets in September and well ahead of the UCN World Conservation Congress in January. I look forward to sharing the results with you later this year and in advance welcome your feedback. Have a great evening. Look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you, John Paul. Um, so why EcoHealth Alliance? Uh, well, we are the only organization that has been on the ground in China for the past 15 years since, SAR since the SARS outbreak and in other parts of the world with unprecedented access to places that are at the greatest risks. What's really exciting about EcoHealth Alliance to me is that not only are our scientists passionate about their work with animals and about the people they work with locally, but they have an equal excitement about communicating clearly, understandably, and authentically about the science. It is through their patient listening and, the, and their actions on behalf of others locally that they have gained trust with people on the ground, with scientists, with farmers, with community leaders, with NGOs, with global organizations. The media calls Peter and, and many of our scientists to get their opinions about what they should be thinking about the science. They are working to uncover the evidence and mitigate the risk while maintaining an acute appreciation of the humans that are in the equation. So I'd like to turn this over to a video to sort of share some of the broadest work that EcoHealth Alliance is doing. A preliminary investigation into a mysterious pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan, China has identified a previously unknown coronavirus. There's new cases being reported as it turns deadly in the U.S. More than 89,000 cases have now been confirmed in 66 different countries, with more than 3,000 deaths reported. The U.S. government is calling the coronavirus outbreak a public health emergency. Across the country, medical workers becoming increasingly desperate for protective equipment. People are stocking up on food and people are scared to use public transportation. It is unimaginable that we're talking about these sorts of numbers and hundreds of people losing their lives every day. The world brought to a complete standstill by an organism 100,000 times smaller than lead in a wooden pencil. Viruses much too small for us to see with the naked eye leave scars on our world that far exceed their size. Just months ago, no one had ever heard of SARS coronavirus 2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Now, there isn't a part of our lives that hasn't been touched by it. For over 45 years, EcoHealth Alliance has been working around the world to protect wildlife and public health from the emergence of disease. And never has our work been more vital than now. Nearly 20 years ago, just as SARS was spreading around the world, EcoHealth Alliance began working on the ground in China. Immediately, our team of scientists got to work, identifying the source of the outbreak at a market where civets had caught the virus from bats and managed to spread it to people. In the years since, EcoHealth Alliance has discovered an incredible diversity of coronaviruses in the region. Working with local partners, we've identified about 700 in all. Panic over Nipah virus is spreading. Nipah virus causes flu-like symptoms and brain inflammation. In Bangladesh, a highly lethal virus called Nipah causes regular outbreaks. Working with local partners, we helped to implement a simple intervention to help prevent the virus's spread, using nets to prevent bats from accessing pots of date palm sap slowing the spread of the virus. Ebola, out of control in West Africa. This is the deadliest outbreak of Ebola on record. When Ebola emerged in West Africa with its devastating potency and deadly spread, again, EcoHealth went on a mission to discover the source. And just last year, announced that we had found live Ebola virus in a bat in West Africa. We are the first to do so. In the past 20 years, we've seen a global outbreak of SARS, an H1N1 flu pandemic, 
the emergence of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, Ebola, Zika, Nipah, and West Nile viruses, and now COVID-19. Simply responding to outbreaks as they happen isn't sufficient. Understanding where outbreaks come from is essential in order to mitigate the harm they cause. Each outbreak begins with a simple act, one interaction between a human and a wild animal leading to the transmission of a potentially deadly pathogen. Our dedicated team is on the ground working with local governments, in-country scientists and policymakers in 30 countries around the globe, focusing on that single interaction. How do we prevent it and how can we limit the threat it presents? There is a better way, a better way to interact harmoniously with our earth, a way that protects our own health, that allows the natural splendor of rainforests, of rivers, of caves to flourish. EcoHealth Alliance is dedicated to that vision. And with your support, EcoHealth Alliance will work tirelessly to further understand our enemy and help stop the next threat before it comes knocking at our door. Wow, inspirational. Um, I never get tired of seeing our scientists in the field doing their work proudly and trying to prevent pandemics. But look, let's be real, the unthinkable has happened. A pandemic has emerged that truly is global in nature and that's devastated our economy that's killing people here in my neighborhood in the outskirts of New York. It's a terrible tragedy. And as we sit in this sort of global pause, I wanna talk about the vision for the future and how we're going to achieve that. Look, what is our current strategy to deal with pandemics? Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I've gotta be brutally frank, we don't have a strategy. We wait for pandemics to emerge, we scramble, we're doing this social distancing, our economy collapses, and we hope and pray that vaccines and drugs will come our way. Meanwhile, viruses are out there right now, spilling over into people in a remote part of Africa, Asia, India, Latin America, and getting ready to spread. This is what they do. So what are we gonna do? Our science shows that this, these pandemics are increasing in frequency. Uh, we need to do something different. We need to think different. We need to get down on the ground and move out and try and prevent pandemics, not just wait for them to happen. So we're trying to address this in multiple ways. First of all, we're working with the vaccine and drug designers to develop vaccines and drugs that don't just work against the last pathogen, but work against all the other pathogens out there in wildlife. We're out there on the ground around the world in emerging disease hotspots, discovering those viruses that, that we don't know about yet and getting the sequences into the hands of the drug designers to develop better drugs. That's exactly what we've done with remdesivir, the breakthrough drug we heard about yesterday. But we need to do more. We can't have this one year wait between a pandemic and a drug or a vaccine where people die and economies collapse. So we're putting out a call now, right now in the, in the darkest hour of this pandemic to think about the future strategy. This is our vision. We need to be out in the places where viruses exist. Those are the emerging disease hotspots where EcoHealth Alliance works. We need to be working with the vulnerable communities on the front line of those, the rural people of China, Southeast Asia and Africa, the people that hunt and eat wildlife and don't know that it has a huge health hazard for them and for the planet. We need to work with the governments that control the legislation around the wildlife trade and help them find alternatives that aren't gonna crash their economies, but are gonna to move towards a more sustainable planet. We need to work with corporations on the ground around the world who develop land for agriculture. This is something we, we demand, we need. Consumers in the West drive this. We need to work with mining companies, with logging companies, with palm oil companies, and help them with their corporate social responsibility in a way that's not only good for conservation, but also good for our health. Most of all, we all need to get involved and we can do this. We can take a moment during this pandemic and look at the visions we've seen. In this global pause, we've seen reduced pollution around the world. We've seen the Himalayas visible from North India for the first time in years. 
We've seen the rivers and canals clean in Venice, for instance. Uh, we've seen air pollution drop. We've seen carbon dioxide drop. Now, that's not sustainable. We need to get back to business. But as we return to business, let's remember this vision and let's work together to just be a little bit more sustainable, be a little bit more conscious of our environmental footprint and do things to reduce that. That will not only be better for conservation, it'll be better for our planet, it'll be directly better for us. It will help take us out of the pandemic era. That's our vision. We want you to join us in, in making that vision a reality. So now I want to um, turn to some of the trusted voices, the colleagues who know us intimately, know our work, and have spent their lives turning the science into public understanding of science. Linda Obst, whose documentaries and movies have a science-based theme, but turn them into a way that people understand and appreciate. We need that more than ever. David Quirman, whose books take us from our lockdown rooms into the jungles of Africa, into the caves of China, and help us live through that and understand what's going on. And Jay Varma, who is right now working with the Africa CDC to get ready for the next wave of pandemic, which is coming very soon, which will be the increase in cases in developing countries. Now, we're all connected. We know that that's something we've learned from COVID-19. And as those developing countries begin to have really high cases, that will in turn threaten all of us. So once again, we need to be out there on the ground in the places that need us the most. Keeping viruses over there protects us over here. That's our message. Over to our friends. Right now we're experiencing, the entire world is experiencing our most profound earthly nightmare, a global pandemic. The very thing that epidemiologists and virologists and public health officials, like the ones at the Echo Health Alliance, have been worrying about and warning about for years. I got to know the scientists at Echo Health Alliance when I was working on the hot zone. From contact to interstellar to hot zone, I've looked to find what the real heroes are and the great stories are. and. I look to find the stories of the overlooked critical workers on the front lines of science. These are our real heroes, not the caped ones. Only scientists can help us. Only science can save the day here. No spin, no theory, no ideology, only science, only facts. And that is a thrilling moment for me. It's really, to me, the silver lining of this moment. Because scientists have been my heroes forever. But now they're going to be the world's heroes. I'm David Quammen, author of the book Spillover, Animal Infections in the Next Human Pandemic, among other things. Uh, and uh, that book was published in 2012. It couldn't have been written if I hadn't fallen in with EcoHealth Alliance and uh, some of the wonderful people who work there. I couldn't have written Spillover if I hadn't been helped and been invited along by people from EcoHealth Alliance. With Jonathan Epstein, I went to, where was it, Jonathan? Bangladesh, and in the middle of the night, we, uh, we trapped large fruit bats uh, looking for Nipah virus. I went with Alexei Chimura to Southern China, and in caves outside the city of Guilin, uh, we crawled in and netted small insectivorous bats looking for the SARS coronavirus. Uh, with Billy Karish, I went uh, several places. I went with him to uh, Cambodia and watched him vaccinate chickens along the Vietnam border at a time when bird flu was an issue. Most important for me was seeing the process, seeing the way these amazing scientists go into difficult places and do the detective work that's necessary to understand dangerous zoonotic viruses 
that might spill over into humans and oh, for instance, from a, a bat in China turn into a global pandemic. My name is Jay Varma and I'm a physician and epidemiologist that worked, has worked around the world, uh, including uh, quite often with uh, the team from EcoHealth Alliance. And I'm currently uh, serving as a senior advisor uh, in public health uh, to the mayor to help with the crisis that we have here in the city. I really wanna um, take this opportunity to highlight the incredible importance of the work that, that EcoHealth does. Um, I've worked uh, with EcoHealth and uh, been following the work uh, throughout my career. Uh, I started uh, in Atlanta with CDC, spent five years in Southeast Asia working on emerging infectious diseases, then three years in China, uh, six years here in New York, and most recently for the past three years in Ethiopia. Uh, throughout that time, it's been incredibly obvious um, how little uh, interaction there has been uh, relative to the need uh, to connect the environmental, the animal, and the human health communities. Uh, and EcoHealth, uh, through its science, uh, its advocacy, um, has played a, really a critical role in making sure that One Health is not simply a phrase that we use, uh, but rather a concept that we live and take action on. These scientists, you who work through Echo Health Alliance, and you who Echo Health Alliance supports, you virologists and public health workers who've striven to contain Ebola and MERS and SARS and now coronaviruses, you who are studying the novel diseases that emerge when we encroach the native habitats of wild animals. You are studying the microscopic threats that lay in wait for us, that need to be identified so that we can have treatments and eventually cures. You have been our first line of defense against the pandemonium we now see reigning all around the world. This is what EcoHealth Alliance does. This is the day job for these people out there, gathering the data that makes us all safer. I think there's no other experience like this coronavirus one um, to teach us about how important it is for us to make the investments that are necessary to do the things that we need to do to protect public health. So again, I wanna thank EcoHealth uh, for giving me the opportunity to greet you all today. Uh, and I look forward to a longstanding collaboration so that we can uh, both control this immediate crisis as well as improve public health for all of us in the future. Thank you. Thanks to all of you who spoke on behalf of yourselves and EcoHealth Alliance. You know, every year, our greatest source of unrestricted funds, the money that we use to innovate and to turn our research into actual policy comes from our gala. Since the majority of our funding comes from grants for specific activities, this is very important to us. And while this year has probably put us on the map, not for a good reason, not, not desirable on that, in that sense. Um, the public acknowledgement that this work, as you heard from the last four speakers, including Peter, that this work is so important. Um, you have an opportunity to help us do the work. And I will have to throw in the Five Star Charity Navigator Award that we get every year because our money is so efficiently spent on the research on the work on the ground that you've been hearing about. It is of, of course a challenging time to raise funds, but last year we had an extraordinary gala and an extraordinary auctioneer. Um, we were blown away by his manner and his uh, incredible commitment to the work we're doing. So we managed to snag him again this year and he's going to try to tell you why you really should invest in EcoHealth Alliance in our auction. So I'm turning it over to you, Lucas Hunt. Thank you, Nancy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's come to the part of the program you've all been waiting for. We are in a fight for our lives. And tonight, you can make a difference. EcoHealth is an alliance of people who make the world a better place. Scientists, nurses, healthcare workers, the medical community. Now, you can help fund the vital mission of fighting world pandemics. How to do that? 
click on the link in your browser, eha.givesmart.com. Or you can go in on your phone if you registered for the event and text GIVE to 76278. That's the word GIVE to 76278. Thanks to the generosity of an impeccably generous donor, we have a $20,000 match to kick off our fund mission this evening. That means all of your gifts will be doubled up to $20,000. So thank you. If we could get four people to give at 5,000, that 20,000 doubles to 40. Thank you. I'm just watching right now, Dominique and Suzanne for your $1,000 gifts. Every amount counts if you'd like to give 5,000, 2,500, 1,000. Barbara, thank you for your $500 gift. And Andrea and Linda, thank you for your $250 gifts. Folks, we appreciate these gifts. They're rolling in right now. Every amount counts. If philanthropy doesn't excite you at the very moment, how about a little hedonism? Because we have an especially vibrant live auction. Met Opera Tickets with Peter, our founder, Daily Show tickets, Billy Joel tickets. We've got Bronx Zoo that's blowing up right now. If you're into delectable meals, we have Per Se. We have the French Laundry. That's up to 5,000. A lot of these are lower starting prices. And we have an internship with Eco Health Alliance so that someone that you know and love can be intimate with our work. So to get into the live auction, text EHA to 76278. To give to our fund the mission, text Give to 76278 or just go on the GiveSmart site, eha.givesmart.com. And I'll join you later. We'll see how the auction's doing. I'll tell you about some of the updates, but every amount counts. Thank you tonight for being with us. Peter, back over to you. Thank you so much, Lucas. And thank you, everybody, for supporting us. You know, it's, I want to be um, uh, a little bit honest with you about when I took over as president of EcoHealth Alliance, you know, you're suddenly in this position running an organization. And there's a certain moment when you look around you and think, well, what is an organization, a nonprofit that's trying to do something around the world? Well, we're exactly that. We're our mission. Our mission is to prevent pandemics and deal with the underlying drivers that, are, that affect the environment, like deforestation and the wildlife trade. But we're really a collection of people people who believe in that mission, like you who've joined us tonight, like our board members who give their time as volunteers to the organization and give our wonderful advice and manage the governance of our organization. And like our staff who work for us under incredibly difficult circumstances on the ground around the world. And you know, our, our alliance stretches way beyond that too. We have partners in about 30 countries right now we have partners in governments, in the, in, in the ministries, in the academia around the world, and in labs in every country we work with. We have partners here in our federal government who support us, and we supply them with the critical uh, information they need to prevent pandemics from affecting us here in the US. That's what EcoHealth Alliance is. So I want you to meet some of our staff. Now, EcoHealth Alliance staff are very carefully selected when we hire people. Um, we select people for the diversity of their talents, mathematicians, lab scientists, veterinarians, for the diversity of their backgrounds and their culture and their vision. But one thing's really critical, they need to be able to adapt to any situation. And Anne Lodiswa, who you're gonna meet now, is, an, is a perfect example of a, a staff member at EcoHealth. She's equally at home in a lab, pipetting reagents, uh, meeting with a minister or doing a congressional briefing here in the US or in the bush of Africa, which luckily for her is where she found herself when she went into lockdown. Over to you in Uganda and Lodiswa. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Uganda. I am Anne Lodiswa and I've been confined here since the 17th of March. I didn't really plan to be here, but I was on my way to the DRC to work on chimpanzees, and then the border started to close. So I looked around and I tried to find a place where there was an open uh, surrounding, where I could still work, and um, even though we had no idea how long it would take. So now we are the 27th of April, we are still confined, and we will be confined till the 5th of May and maybe later, we have no idea. 
here I live with four people. One of them is called Peter Julius. He's doing a bit of gardening and also taking care of ourselves and the security. And uh, he recently got a very nice haircut. Peter, hey. say hello. Selby. <laughs> Habari. Habari. Yeah. I can't see the elephant. They were here. There were two of them there, but now they don't appear. Yeah, they are going to the neighbors again. So the neighbors are even like <laughs> uh, ringing bells and shouting to try to prevent them from coming in their fields. <sighs> Let's see if we can get the other people here. So no elephants. And here is the main room and the gym. So Mid Vianne is the manager of the place. Come on, Vianne. Hello. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> and we are in the Lerla and uh, Colette. Colette, Colette, yes, yes, inside. Colette. Uh -huh. So Scary. let's go in the kitchen. Oh, Cinderella is there. Nobody is in the kitchen. It's not yet time to do to make prepare a dinner. And Cindy is my hairdresser too, actually. Look at that. And Colette is awaking as well. But the elephants are not. Come on, they were just basing by my place and now they disappeared in the bush. In the night, we also have big animals coming. And I'm going to finish with that. Enjoy. Also, notice the, inter the potential interspecific contact between bats and hippopotamus. Have a good evening, enjoy, and be safe, everybody. Bye. Wow. Okay, so I think uh, Anne chose a very beautiful place to be on lockdown. That's it for hundreds of miles. That's their community. She's pretty safe. Now, Kevin Oliveau. Kevin Oliveau is uh, our executive uh, pres vice president for science research. Kevin, you're, um, you, where are you on lockdown, by the way? You're in New York, aren't you? You're on mute. Kevin, you need to go off mute. Rookie maneuver. I'm right here in Brooklyn. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, I think we chose um, badly. So we're in lockdown here in New York. Kevin, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about getting a, around the world to deal with pandemics, but how do we know where we should be working? And, you know, how could we have predicted that this coronavirus would emerge from China? I mean, we, clearly we were right. We were working there already. How do we know that, that Ebola virus is going to emerge in Africa? How do we know where it's going to come from? Yeah, these are, these are challenging questions, challenging scientific questions. And, and this, one of the strengths of EcoHealth Alliance is really bringing together all these disciplines, mathematical modelers with ecologists, um, conservationists, uh, spatial analysts, you know, looking at geographic patterns. And what we've done is we've actually trolled through, um, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of data, if you will, looking at all the past emerging diseases and all the human, you know, environmental factors that sort of lead to those emergences. And we're able to, to, to put that information together and, and define these hotspots of emerging infectious diseases around the planet. And some of that is quite nuanced. So for example, you know, with COVID-19, well, there's only a certain group of bats that seem to be the natural hosts for some of these viruses uh, in, in nature that occur across Southeast Asia. Um, so, you know, the risk is, is not uniform and it takes a particular analysis to understand where that risk is geographically and in what species and what human interfaces we need to look at. Okay, so you, you mentioned it right there, Kevin, you said bats. Um, and, you know, we know now that bats are probably involved with Ebola, with rabies, with Hendra and Nipah virus, and now SARS and COVID-19 probably. What is it about bats? I mean, they already get a bad rap as it is. What is going on with bats? Why are they special? Yeah, bats are fascinating creatures. I mean, they're 20% they're of all the mammal diversity on this planet. So there's about 1,400 species of bats. So they're found on every continent, uh, in every 
you know, in every country uh, and, and a very high diversity of them in the tropics. And they're, they're ecologically critical animals. Um, but the one thing that sets bats apart is they fly. And, and actually that process of flight where the, the metabolism and the body temperature of the animal ramps up every night when it goes out to forage um, actually causes a lot of damage to cells, uh, inflammation. And there's a lot of great research that, that our group and our collaborators are doing to better understand um, how do bats cope with that inflammation and that, and that uh, big stress on their body. And some of it seems to be uh, some unique adaptations to their immune system. And so we might actually learn a lot from studying bats about our own health and developing treatments for ourselves. And, and I think there's you know, a lot we can learn from studying these animals. And of course, bats are pretty critical in the ecosystem. They perform incredible, valuable service getting rid of pest insects. And for those of you who like a drink of tequila, bats pollinate the agave cacti be, uh, that lead to tequila. So that's critical. If you're having a drink right now, think of the bats when you do that. Kevin, I want to ask you one last question. You know, and one of the things that I really love about going out to the field sites, you know, seeing wildlife and going to these amazing places, eating the food, but it's the people that I find fascinating, the cultures. Um, we work in some really remote areas, and often these communities are disenfranchised as it is. They're poor, they're on the margins. Um, how do we work with those communities? How can we be going out there? Or, or is it us that does it? How does it work? Yeah, our scientists do go out in the field all the time. You saw Anne Lodeswaa out there right now in Uganda. Um, but we work, we, can't, we don't do it alone. We don't just fly in and collect samples and, and do that type of work. Our work has always been for decades in close partnership with local scientists and not only with scientists, but local community members. You know, I've been to remote villages in Indonesia where, you know, we have to spend a couple days meeting with the village chief. In fact, we lived in his house while we were doing field work one time, sleeping on the floor. You know, so, so we developed these, these really close connections with the community, uh, with the local public health, uh, animal health, environmental scientists in each country. Um, that really provide us uh, the access to work with local scientists to do the work. And, and you're right. I mean, the risk, uh, unfortunately, that the risk is disproportionate. And many of the people that have a high contact with wildlife that rely on wildlife for their livelihood are those that are most exposed um, and on the front lines of new spillovers and new emerging diseases. And, and so what we're doing is working with those communities um, to, to, to not only consider their risk and their behaviors, but their livelihoods and, and how can they change their way of doing, interacting with animals, but not impacting their bottom line and feeding their families. Well, Kevin, you know, I, I just want on behalf of everyone tonight, thank you for the work you do. You're live here in New York. I know you don't like to be on lockdown. I know you're itching to get back on a plane get, and get out into the field and do your work. So Thank you for everything you do, and I look forward to you getting back out there. I want to turn now to another trusted voice and long-term friend and collaborator, Dr. Richard Besser. He is also one of our past honorees at our benefit. Uh, Dr. Besser is a former acting director of CDC. He's a former trusted voice for the medical community from ABC uh, TV, and he's now the director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Dr. Besser. I'm Dr. Rich Besser. I'm president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and I want to thank you for inviting me to join your virtual gala. At the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we're the, we're the nation's largest philanthropy focused on health in America. Our focus is on working towards a day in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity for health and well-being. Um, you can see how this is playing out now during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we are a nation of haves and have-nots for many people. Uh, sheltering in place, social distancing is a matter of, of great inconvenience, uh, but is, is tolerable. For other people, they're being asked to make a, a life or death decision. Um, do you go out and earn an income and put food on the table and pay rent? Or do you stay home and protect yourself, your family, and your community? This is something that no one should have to choose in the short term. We need support from the government to make sure that people have money in their pockets to take care of the things that need to be done. Longer term, we're working towards policy solutions. 
so that how long you live does not depend on how much money you make or the color of your skin. I'm a big fan of EcoHealth Alliance and their work to understand how disease transmit around the world to work towards earlier detection. Uh, if you detect something earlier, you may be able to take steps sooner to protect people's health. So I urge you to support their work. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is true today and it will be true tomorrow that we are only as safe as everyone is safe and that a disease anywhere in the world poses a threat to people everywhere in the world. So thank you so much for your support. I hope you stay safe and well and have a good evening. Well, that's very interesting. Um, to go back a little bit, uh, EcoHealth Alliance began 45 years ago as a conservation organization. And while we remain committed to conservation today, which I think you've heard, we recognized a while ago that saving animals wasn't sufficient. We saw that a thread pulled on one continent could lead to a great unraveling halfway around the world. We saw that we needed to be looking at the planet with a systems perspective, that the needs of animals, humans, and the ecosystem needed to be brought into balance. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce you to Dr. William Koresh Billy, as we call him, and you've heard him referred to several times, who coined the term One Health, so simple and profound that it became the slogan of a movement. One Health is shorthand today for the importance of a systems approach to complex problems of human expansion and its impact on animals and environmental health. And the implementation of policies and behaviors that are supported by science, not by whim. So I'll turn it over to you, Billy. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. William Karish, Executive Vice President for Health and Policy at EcoHealth Alliance. We've been talking about this how pandemics get started this evening and the spread of diseases. I really wanted to get us focused on One Health. When I came up with that term, One Health, we were in the midst of Ebola outbreaks in West and Central Africa. I was working in the field. We were really concerned because great apes, gorillas and chimpanzees were dying by the thousands and people were getting infected from touching or hunting or handling great apes. So we knew we had to have an approach that brought together human health and the health of the environment and the health of wildlife in some term that was easy for people to grasp, hence the name One Health. We were also seeing gorillas infected by human diseases, such as measles. And the only safe approach to that, while it's difficult to vaccinate wild animals, we could encourage the vaccination of children living in local communities and use that then to protect the gorillas. So there's this partnership between human health and the health of wildlife and the health of animals that we found was very compelling and using the term One Health really explained it. That term is caught on, the World Bank uses it, the United Nations uses it, but it really started from on the ground work in the field and at EcoHealth Alliance, that's exactly what we still do every day around the world in the field, engaging local communities, working across different sectors, we work with animal health people, we work with human health, we work with finance ministries, we work with education people to get the message that health is not just the responsibility and the obligation of the health sector, it works across all of society. We all have to participate as we're seeing now with COVID-19, we all have to pitch in. Thank you so much, Billy. Now I want to introduce you to John Epstein, our Vice President for Science and Outreach. John, you're from the conservation medicine field, you're a veterinarian, you're well known for your work on bats. What is it like working in West Africa on Ebola, in, in Malaysia on Nipah virus, in China in the caves? What is it that drives you? Because you're a veterinarian, you could have been working on any of the animals that you're normally trained to work on. Yeah, well, first of all, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. And, and Peter, it's a funny question because I didn't know when I first learned how to work with bats 
about 20 years ago now that I'd ever do it again. Uh, it was my first research experience as a graduate student studying an emerging disease at the time in Australia, which was a rabies type virus that required us to go out and study bats. And I thought, well, this was fun, but I'll never do it again. And, you know, I loved the experience. And then, you know, you and I started working together and we had a grant, you got a grant for Nipah virus to study it in Malaysia that was linked to a similar type of bats. And it just became, uh, you know, just a, a phenomenon that we started to understand more and more that bats played a really crucial role in our health in terms of their association with emerging zoonoses. Um, but, but in terms of what it's like and how it is, I got into veterinary medicine to work with wildlife, inspired by people like Billy, like Dr. Karish. And uh, it's tremendous to know that we can work with wild animals to both help protect them by protecting ecosystems, but also to understand our own health and make us safer as well. So to me, it's the best of all worlds. Now you've worked in uh, Bangladesh for many years. You're one of, the, one of the people that I know who loves going to those countries. You love interacting with the people, you love the food and the wildlife, um, but that's a challenging place to work. I mean, when you see people um, in, Poverty like that, who are so, so suffering diseases that are that we know we can understand and do a better job of. What what do you say to them? How do you deal with that that uh, that issue right there in front of you? I think it's so important for me on a personal level to be in those environments to really understand firsthand the kind of choices people have to make. You know, it's it's sometimes too easy for us to sit here in New York or in the United States and say about people on the other side of the world that they should stop hunting wildlife, they should stop doing something that we know creates risk, when really often they have no other choice. So to be working uh, in communities that that have to make choices about survival, that have to make really hard choices about whether to feed their family and protect their livelihood, or perhaps do something that may be risky. We know it's risky, but to them, they don't perceive it to be hugely risky. And the second thing is, I think if we're ever going to hope to change some of these high-risk behaviors where it is feasible and practical, we need to have an understanding of the context, the social context for that. And so being immersed in those environments is really critical to start to understand how to make those behavior changes in a way that is culturally appropriate and sensitive. And what goes hand in hand with that, I'll say, is how important it is to work with local scientists, which we always have done and will continue to do. Local social scientists who have a firsthand understanding of the, the cultural mores and the things that motivate people to do behaviors that might be high risk in terms of emerging diseases. And that's the only way we're gonna start to be able to really create interventions that are gonna be palatable, that are gonna be feasible for people on the ground? So now a sort of tough question, you know, we've got, we know COVID-19 came here to the US, yeah. but why should we be spending all of our funds out in other countries around the world dealing with their problems, which don't emerge here? Why is that? And, and what do you say to people who say, we should be focused on America's issues? Is that what we're doing? I think there's no more obvious example than COVID-19 that it is America's issue, that even if it emerged in China or in another country, that we are not insulated from the rest of the world. And we haven't been for a very long time. So it is absolutely in our interest to invest in working in the parts of the world that are most vulnerable, that are most at risk to emerging diseases. And that means strengthening systems. And something we've done a lot of over the past two decades is work with government partners in countries, as well as local scientists, strengthening field scientists to go out and safely be able to look at wildlife and see what other viruses might be circulating, strengthening laboratory scientists to help those systems detect novel viruses and be better prepared to deal with them. And all of that not only helps our partners in the countries that are vulnerable, but it certainly helps the United States. And I think we're seeing that in sharp relief right now. Well, John, again, thanks for the work you do. It is a pleasure and honor to have you as a friend and a colleague. We yeah, love what you're doing. Feelings you're more doing. than mutual. Get back yeah. out there. It'll be over soon. Thanks very thanks, much. Peter. Good night. I want to introduce you all now to a friend of ours and supporter um, from the Chan Zuckerberg um, Biohub. It's Christina Tato, who's going to tell us a bit about the high tech approaches and what she's doing to bring that to deal with this continuous threat out there. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak with you all today. I work for the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. 
which is a nonprofit medical research organization based in the San Francisco Bay Area. The mission of our organization is to make fundamental discoveries and to develop new technologies that will lead to actionable diagnostics and effective therapies. The Rapid Response Group at the Biohub leverages the tools and technologies that we develop here in the Bay Area to overcome challenges and solve problems in the realm of global health. We are here as a resource for rapid pathogen detection and identification for outbreak response efforts. We also provide strategies for a One Health approach to public health surveillance, focusing on understanding the entire transmission dynamic of vector, reservoir, and population. Largely, we help to build preparedness platforms by providing tools, standards, as well as training to support sustainable capabilities in laboratories around the world. The overarching goal here is to enable the generation of data for more informed decision making and resource allocation for implementing effective public health strategies. This kind of data can also inform better hypothesis generation for future research and for clinical studies that can be performed in country by national scientists. Before the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic struck, my team was actively engaged in a variety of pro projects with laboratories in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. These projects included training in metagenomic next-generation sequencing tools and access to a cloud-based infectious disease sequencing analysis platform called IDSeq. IDSeq is an open access analytical pipeline that was developed in partnership with software engineers at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, our sister organization. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative supports the use and maintenance of this platform so that our collaborative groups can use it free of charge. Many of the groups we were already working with also happen to be on the front lines of some of the first travel-related cases of COVID-19. Additionally, we knew that with their limited ability to perform testing, it would be much more difficult for these countries to assess the full impact of SARS-CoV-2 on their populations. Early on in the pandemic, before many of these groups had identified cases, we shipped primers and reagents to them to help set up testing assays. As things progressed, many were pulled into helping with testing. Our collaborators in Cambodia, for example, were one of the first groups to be asked to help with their national response. The Pasteur Institute in Cambodia, along with the Ministry of Health, knew of the sequencing capabilities that our collaborators recently established. These three organizations then embarked on a collaborative effort with the dual goal of confirmatory testing of the first presumptive cases and the sequencing of the viral genome. Within 48 hours of receiving the samples from the Pasteur, our trainees had successfully attained the full genome of the virus, uploaded it to GIS aid, and identified its closest ancestor. For the first time, a laboratory in a low resource setting was able to perform outbreak sequencing in real time and contribute to the global body of knowledge on their own. And now, they are continuing to sequence all of the positive samples that the country identifies. Instead of waiting for a Western researcher to analyze these samples months to years later in a retrospective study, this lab now has the capacity to conduct their own surveillance study in real time. And this is exactly what we had hoped a platform like this would achieve. Tools, technologies, and training that was established to address daily public health needs is now capable of being leveraged for conducting outbreak response activities. Cambodia is just one example of what, we can be, what can be achieved, and we continue to support these groups in Bangladesh, Kenya, South Africa, and others as they begin to get both testing for COVID-19 and viral sequencing up and running. We are extremely proud of our collaborating labs, and we are super excited to continue this work into the future. Thank you so much for your time. It's so exciting to hear about other examples of alliances and collaborations because it really is going to take the Earth Village in order to solve this problem, not just, just a few organizations here and there. So, you know, last year at our gala, when the theme was actually pandemics, Peter told us that 8,000 people who became afflicted with SARS cost somewhere between 30 and $50 billion. We asked the audience a year ago to think about what work like ours cost to support and what a global pandemic might cost, thinking that we were a pretty good bargain if you really add it up. I'd ask the same question today, how much would it be worth to avoid another global pandemic? And that only refers to the economics. What about the human cost, the loss of life, the psychic damage, so many lives disrupted by death, by jobs lost, by ensuing political instability. What is the real price tag for so much human suffering? And I think that that is what we are very cognizant of every day as we set about to do what we do. Peter, 
Over to you. Yeah, you know, you're right, Nancy. We've all seen the impacts. We felt them personally of this pandemic. I sit in my office and every now and again, I see an ambulance go past with flashing lights. I know what that is. That's one of my neighbors going to hospital, suffering. We all know someone who's died. I know people personally who died. We all will know someone who's gonna be affected by this pandemic. That's a tragic toll. But we need to stay strong. We need to fight back. We need to change the world and end this pandemic era. You know, our vision is um, based on science. The science tells us that pandemics, unfortunately, are gonna come quicker. They're gonna spread quicker. They're gonna affect more people and they're gonna hit our economy even worse over and over again, unless we do something different. We need a whole earth movement across sectors, across governments, across our planet. That's one thing that COVID has shown us. It's also shown us that vision of our future with cleaner skies, with wildlife that exists in their natural habitat and are eaten and traded around the world, and with no pandemics. That's a vision we can achieve. Because one thing our science has shown us is that if we're behind the pandemic, we have the power to stop the next one. So to do that, we're gonna be out there. We're already planning our work right now in our darkest hour. We're gonna be out there working with communities to help them understand the risk and change behavior, working with national governments around the world to support their efforts, to protect their people so we don't get ill. We're gonna be working with communities, governments, corporations, many of you are listening tonight, and with everybody, we can defeat this pandemic. We have the power. Let's get together, let's support this mission, and let's end the pandemic area. Join us and let's beat this. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight. And I wanna join Peter in thanking you for giving us this hour plus of your time. We also owe a tremendous thanks to Amy Addis, Lisa Silvershine, and Stephen Wills for their tireless work pivoting from live to virtual everything. And we would truly not be here without the dogged determination and untiring attention to detail of our own Robert Kessler, who worked with all of our outside speakers, coaching them on their selfies, you can give him a grade, um, then editing, 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 while managing the dozens of calls we get each day to get EHA, Eco Health Alliance, Peter, and our scientists in the media to get their take on the science behind the pandemic, which I hope you were just interested enough about tonight to want to know more. We hope you found the hour worthwhile. If we left you with questions, and we did think about having a Q&A, and you'd like them answered, please email us at askascientist at ecohealthalliance.org ask a scientist at ecohealthalliance.org and one of our own scientists will get back to you. So for the last words, encouraging you to contribute uh, and to um, bid generously and often, uh, I will turn it over to Lucas and wish all of you good luck and of course, good health. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Peter, did you say bats make tequila? <laughs> worth researching. Folks, our mission is vital, but our methods are marvelous. We have an incredible live auction for you to bid on. We've got the Bronx Zoo, the Late Show, the Bronx Zoo, excuse me. We even have an urban bat experience where you can go around Central Park at night, witness bats, and possibly sip tequila. There is one hour left in the auction and then it's hammer time. So if you have a high bid, you wanna put in on uh, the Mount Carmel package or the Vermont ski package, Yankees tickets, you better do it now. We've got an hour to go. And remember, all you have to do is text 76278, text EHA to bid there, 76278. E H A, and I want to just do a quick shout out to all of our generous donors. We've been raising a lot of money in the last half hour. Lisa, thank you. Leslie, thank you. George, Suzanne, Eric, Melinda, Judy, Harold. I can't get to all the names because there's been so many donations. Uh, if we can raise another six and a half thousand dollars in this final hour's push, we'll meet that twenty thousand dollar match, and it'll double to forty. So. 
One more time, I just want to say thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you for bidding. Thank you for giving. And make sure you drive home safely tonight. <laughs> <laughs>